This is Digital Health Today, episode 43. The way that technology is being applied in some of these areas that are not maybe as sexy as stem cells, but have a bigger impact on a daily basis about the way we deliver care, I think is going to be fun to watch. Welcome to Digital Health Today, the podcast focused on the leaders, innovators, and technologies transforming healthcare today and tomorrow. Find us online at digitalhealthtoday.com. This episode is brought to you by Medible, the app and analytics company for healthcare. Medible invites you to try its Axon solution. Axon makes clinical research easy with its clicks, not code technology. Create your first clinical trial app in just a few minutes. Go to www.medible.com to get a demo today. That's www.medible.com. Welcome back. This is Digital Health Today, the place to be to get the insights of leaders working to make the healthcare of tomorrow available today. I'm your host, Dan Kendall, and this is episode 43. In our previous conversation, we spoke with Jack Barrett, the founder and CEO of WeGo Health. He was on his way out to speak at Health 2.0 in Santa Clara. I heard that meeting was another great event again this year. Congratulations, Matthew Holt and Indu Sabaya, for another exceptional meeting. If you were there, I hope you had a chance to say hello to Jack. And if you didn't get to hear his talk at Health 2.0, go back and tune into episode 42. He gives seven great tips on how to have successful collaboration with patient experts. Everyone talks a great game about patient involvement and focusing on the patient, but often there are some real obstacles to overcome to do that effectively. Jack gives some really useful tips to help engage patient experts on your business challenges, and you should really check out his WeGo Health platform. They're going from strength to strength in that business and making it easier for all of us to get patient input into our projects. During the introduction to Jack's episode, I ran through some of the conferences that are coming up in the remaining months of this year. I also alluded to some of the conferences coming up in 2018. You probably know some of those, like the J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference that's been going on for years, that's being held on the 9th to the 12th of January in San Francisco. And 2018 marks the second year of the Startup Health Festival, which is also being held in San Francisco on January 8th and 9th. Well, Get out your calendars and planners, folks. There's another great event going on out there this year, and today's guest is actually the person behind it. In this episode, I spoke with Professor Stefan Obini. He's an orthopedic surgeon at UCSF and the chair of the Digital Orthopedics Conference. That's right. That's what I said. Digital Orthopedics. I met Stefano through Nick Adkins and Mike Ryan, both of whom were previous guests on this program, episodes 34 and 36, respectively. Go back and check those out. They told me that Stefano was working on some really cool stuff. And well, he and I connected, and Nick, Mike, you guys were right on the money. Stefano is driving things forward out there, and I could not wait to get him on the show to drop some knowledge bombs. He's taking things to a new level by focusing on digital tools, specifically in orthopedics. We all know that this is a very expensive area of healthcare, and it's a specialty ripe for disruption. Need proof? Well, he's here to tell us all about why orthopedics is a great place for us to focus our digital efforts, and he goes through some of the work being done to transform the delivery of orthopedic care. As always, you can grab the show notes on the website. Just visit digitalhealthtoday.com forward slash 43. While you're there, please take a minute to subscribe to the podcast in iTunes. And you know I love it when you write a review. That really helps spread the word and grow our digital health community. Now, without further ado, let's tune into the conversation with Professor Stefano Beanie. Professor Beanie, thanks for joining me and welcome to the program. Thank you, Dan. Excited to be here. Dr. Beanie, I've given the listeners a little bit of background on your experience and some of the things that you're actively working on now. But I have to say that when you and I spoke earlier and we talked about some of the, the places where you've lived and worked, you seem to have had the great fortune of not only traveling to a variety of parts of the world, but you've lived and worked and were educated in parts all around the world. Can you give us a little oversight about some of the great places where you've lived? Hi, Dan. Thanks. Yeah, no, it's been an amazing a journey so far. In fact, I was born in Italy, in the, in Bologna, and uh, my father was a well-known architect and managed to get us to travel for a bit. So I spent my early youth in Australia and Sydney, where I had an amazing experience and so a huge lover of that country. Then we then traveled to California, where I finished high school. Then I went to college at Stanford, spent one of my years uh, in college in France, came back. I uh, went to medical school in Columbia, uh, in New York City. Uh, that was an amazing experience as well, and being the Big Apple. From New York, uh, came um, uh, back to California, went to UCSF uh, for my residency. And after residency, spent uh, a little time overseas. I spent two months in the country of Bhutan, and delivering care in that country, which was a wonderful experience. And then traveled through the subcontinent of India for a while, which was really a really life-changing experience as well, being that uh, such a different perspective on life uh, over there. 
After that, I started my fellowship at the Rizzoli Institute, which is a huge orthopedic institute in Bologna, Italy, where I learned an awful lot, uh, a completely different perspective on orthopedics than I had received in the United States. And that uh, led to a lifelong love of uh, trying to bridge the various perspectives on uh, care delivery systems around the world. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to be able to come back to start work uh, as an orthopedic surgeon in California. So that got me back here and since then gotten more involved with uh, international orthopedics and other things of that nature to keep that interest going. Wow, that is a lot of traveling. And I know you've been in San Francisco since 1990. So it sounds like that's really a place where you found your home. That's correct. It's an amazing, amazing place. I, I just love being here. When we spoke earlier about some of the training that you had when you were over in Italy and some of the experiences that you had when you came to the U.S., to San Francisco, you were explaining that there was a difference in terms of the standard and the, some of the advancements that were happening in orthopedics. Can you explain a little bit about what, that, what was happening, what you observed? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, 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 um, I'm an associate editor for the journal Arthroplasty Today, and a little couple of years, uh, a few months ago, I wrote a, an editorial about this. So it's an experience that I, I like to share. So what happened was that essentially I'd been, I think, pretty well trained in the United States. I'd gone to Stanford, Columbia, and the University of California, San Francisco. And so I arrived in Italy thinking that you know, maybe I've got a thing or two to teach them. Uh, about how to do things, and uh, I guess that was a little brash and a little arrogant on my part, but they very quickly kind of told me to sit down and just listen for a while and see what they did over there. And what I found was that in many areas, this is back in 1997, they were approximately 10 years ahead of my colleagues and my training here in the United States, and I can certainly give some examples. Um, everything from the management of open fractures. Uh, those days in the United States were extremely leery of letting anything that that had a potential contamination, weight, um, so everything was an emergency, whereas in, in Europe by then they already figured out that if you did a small washout in the emergency room and provided antibiotics to the patient, you could delay surgery f until the time was right for both the patient and the operating room, and that sort of perspective was quite different. The use of certain metals in orthopedics were sort of stuck on cobalt chrome as the principal metal, and the, the Europeans had figured out that titanium was a much friendlier metal to the body it was physiologically better accepted by the body it was a, just a better material and so i was using titanium they're using titanium implants way earlier than us in the states this is minor points but it, the, the biggest issue wasn't so much that it was that one tends to get a little bit insular in one's own environment uh, and if one is not exposed or looks around for ideas that may be different from what we're accustomed to, we might miss the boat to some degree. And I think that's been sort of a bit of a life lesson ever since. I'm always looking what other people are doing as far away as possible from where I am. So that was the mid-90s when you noticed all those differences between the U.S. and the European approach to orthopedics. Where do you think things are now? Has the gap closed a little bit? You said they were 10 years ahead of where you were in the mid-90s. Have they come closer together or have the Europeans continued to accelerate in these areas and the U.S. still lag a little bit behind? I think that that's actually 1997 by the time that sort of that, that experience came back. Um, I came back from that experience. It, the disparities are not as broad as it used to be. There's been uh, within, I think, within my specialty, a bit of a um, uh, identification at this point of what the optimal modalities are for some of these more technical things, and now we're much more focused on process change. And from that perspective, we're still learning. Another example, I think it was the Dutch that pioneered rapid recovery programs after surgery that have now be called ERAS, or early recovery after surgery, that pioneered the idea of feeding patients early, giving them liquids early, changing sort of the paradigms of the past around that. And that's been widely adopted in the United States. On the other hand, in the United States, we are pioneering um, early discharge from hospitals using sort of even digital resources for delivering post-operative care. I think that's being pioneered more strongly in the United States now. But I think there's a symbiosis that's a little more progressive now than it used to be 15, 20 years ago. Well, you're certainly sitting in a global hotspot for technology and innovation uh, across a variety of verticals, and healthcare is no exception. Uh, you're based there at UCSF, but you're actually drilling down a little bit deeper and, and you're focusing specifically in, in your area around orthopedics, which is an area that really we don't hear a lot about specifically as it relates to digital health. Can you tell me some of the things that you've seen and that you're working on and maybe give a little bit of reason why this has sort of flipped some switches for you that, that made this something you've really wanted to focus on? 
That's a great question, Dan. Thank you very much for asking it because it gives me the opportunity to talk about some things I'm very passionate about. So I'll break down your answer into three elements. What, what's the need to drill down into vertical? And then uh, what opportunities we are seeing being deployed within that vertical? And then maybe talk about some of the specifics within that. So the reasoning around the idea of drilling down to vertical came to me as I started looking at this healthcare space all good eight, 10 years ago um, in terms of IT. And at the time, it seemed like an opportunity. But as people started grappling with the size and enormity of this huge thing we call healthcare, I think most people are starting to kind of realize that it's really, really hard to address all of healthcare in any one app, any one platform, any one solution. And the sort of the storyline I often give is like, well, if you were open a restaurant, you wouldn't necessarily have Thai food, Indian food, Mexican food, Italian food, Korean food, all on the same menu. It would be really hard to do any of that well. Even if you could touch on it, you probably focus on one thing and do that well and learn from that experience and then maybe open other restaurants. I'm not sure exactly why. We do that in almost every other field. I don't think a venture capital firm would ever focus, give a company money if it wasn't laser focused on an outcome or a process. And yet in medicine, we tend to look at healthcare as a whole. So my argument has always has been in recent is like maybe we have better luck trying to promote some of these ideas and get implementation of these tools if we integrated them and got them to work together with an already integrated silo. And I don't, we don't like silos, but these verticals exist and they, they already have within them the infrastructure within which to accept new modules and any kind of change. So then you have to decide which vertical to pick on. Well, as a scientist, we like to do, if you're trying to come up with a proof of concept of anything is to minimize the variables that can impact that outcome. And one thing about orthopedic surgery is that it's a high, or the whole musculoskeletal space is it tends to deal with patients that are relatively healthy, the problems which have a relatively short cycle time. So you're looking at usually within six months you can impact an outcome. It's a relatively costly subspecialty or area of cost so small changes can have a can have a large financial impact it's relatively centralized you don't have to hit every clinic on the planet to have an impact on musculoskeletal care it tends to be centralized in larger centers and so for these reasons and i could go into others it seems like a really perfect sort of petri dish within which to run experiments and make things work together and I'd figure out how to make them work together. And then afterwards, you solve that solution, move it over to maybe other like specialties. So that's the reason to focus on a specialty. And then we look at what's actually happening is a lot of people have figured that out. So if you look at the telehealth space, a large number of companies are looking at using telehealth medicine to support orthopedic care, whether it's prehabilitation or post-habilitation, managing of back pain, all the sports apps and the wellness apps really are in that space of wellness through exercise, which is musculoskeletal care. And then the payment models, if you look at what Medicare did, is they looked for a place where they could test some of these ideas of, of alternate payment models. And where they started the bundles, they started them in orthopedics, specifically in joint replacement surgery, which is what I do. Because, yes, all those things, it's, it's a large chunk of what they do in terms of financial costs. But it's this well described. It's uh, it's limited. So for those three reasons, basically, healthcare is kind of too big to tackle. Focusing on one specialty or one area, one vertical, and integrating within that vertical to make sure things work well before you move on. And then the fact that a lot of the technology we currently have really does apply itself well to orthopedics. You just touched on telehealth as one of the potential areas, but there's lots of different technologies that you know people have different definitions of what digital health is. And if you heard Matthew Holt uh, a few episodes ago, he was talking about how he doesn't even like the term digital health. But inside the digital health bucket, you know, we've got telehealth, we've got VR, you've got AI. There's all sorts of sensors and uh, software and things that can go into the the digital health bucket. What are some of the technologies that you're seeing? You mentioned telehealth. What else are you seeing that broadly has applications within orthopedics? And can you tell us a little bit about how those can make an impact on the practice of orthopedics. Or should we call it Smack Ortho? Um. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. Little shout out to Matthew there. Smack Ortho. There you go. Buy the domain name before he snaps it up. <laughs> That's exactly right. Um, so look, um, so the study of musculoskeletal care is a study of motion, right? So actually sensors are going to have a huge impact on orthopedics, whether the wearable sensors that we're more accustomed with, like Fitbit kind of devices, or some of the more um, interesting applications with ring-based sensors that are closer to the body. 
but also um, you have companies that are looking at wearables in terms of the, our clothing and, and, and placing sensors in our clothing and driving a huge data acquisition platform around everything we do on a daily basis around motion and how that impacts, of course, all our physiologic functions. So I think the sensors are going to have a big play within orthopedics. The other part, uh, the other technology is that... Can we just pause there for a second? There, oh, sure. so, so to talk about the sensor piece, certainly in terms of the wearable side and being able to gather all this data... That's something that that broadly we'll be able to use and find some of the the data is telling us. But how does that specifically work in terms of prehabilitation? Are there any uh, sensors or applications that you see in development for prehabilitation or post-surgery rehabilitation using sensors in ways that hadn't been done before? Maybe combining sensors with a telehealth platform so people can use, you know, Microsoft Connect to be able to track their movement and try to match their exercise and things like that. Hey, can you give us any sort of specific examples of where else sensors can be applied? Yeah, look, I think one of the most interesting ones is the use of sensors to collect passively generated patient reported outcomes. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the PRO concept, but basically it's part of the whole value proposition in healthcare is trying to collect some quality metrics around the, the work that's been done. Yes, I am familiar with it, and I think it's a brilliant application. So let's talk about how sensors can be used to drive better insights into patient-reported outcomes. Absolutely. So this is a study we're currently under uh, doing right now at UCSF. For example, we, we partner with three sensor companies to, to use their sensors, collect their data. We're looking at data acquisition for six weeks before surgery on patients 24-7, followed by six weeks after surgery, again, 24-7. And to start answering some of these questions, because right now, even though the technology is available, we don't know a bunch of things. We don't know how much data is necessary to get a signal about somebody's overall health. Does, do we need to get data every two seconds or is it sufficient to get data once a week? We don't know what type of data is most useful, whether it's pelvic motion, number of steps, a correlation between those two plus heart rate. And we're looking to figure that out and identify the signals within that. Once we have that sort of figured out, us and other centers are looking at this sort of thing. Then we can start looking at what data points correlate the best with these current goal standard, which are these patient reported outcomes, which are snapshots. And very quickly, I suspect, we'll be able to have a much more refined uh, understanding of care models in terms of how they impact a patient's, a patient's overall outcomes. This is, the, I think, the promise of digital health is what I'm coming back to, which is the idea that, put it this way, something like 20 30% of the care we deliver as physicians, as anybody in the healthcare system, is unnecessary because it doesn't actually have an outcome that we're expecting or want or need. However, the problem is we don't know what 30%. So we deliver it all because we don't want to miss anything. Where all these sensors, et cetera, will allow us to do will be to sort of triage and deliver the care that's necessary to the folks that need it when they need it, as opposed to everybody, whether or not they we need it because we don't know. So once you start being able to follow a patient's recovery for, say, for example, postoperatively, and realize that only this subset of patients needs these resources, then we can take the resource savings by not allocating the other resources and apply them to people who really need them. So this is, I think, one of the great values, value propositions of looking at some of these sensors specifically and the feedback they give us so that we allow us to be more targeted in our delivery models and sort of in the same overall big bucket as precision medicine, although they're looking at it slightly differently, but it's the same concept and idea. Wow. Thanks for that explanation. That sounds like a fantastic study. I look forward to seeing the results when those are available. And I think that's a great example of the potential power of these sorts of devices. And I'm glad you're doing the research to assess exactly how these things can be used and how we can drive out costs and provide better outcomes for patients. Tell me about some of the other products that you're seeing out there that have you excited, the other technologies. Look, I think virtual reality is going to be a big player in in the orthopedic space, especially in the perioperative space, which I live in because of uh, allowing patients to experience virtually what they will experience afterwards, and that will help a lot with anxiety, and it will help a lot with them understanding what expectations. Um, I think we're going to have a a huge impact of virtual reality in education and uh, disseminating anything from surgical techniques to um, knowledge bases. The ability to virtually perform an operation is going to be a really huge improvement over the current model of uh, C1, do one, teach one. I don't think necessarily that needs to be 
something that is limited to trainees. For example, if you look at the work that Shafi Ahmed is doing over there in London with virtual reality surgery, where it's been watched by uh, people all over the planet uh, who may be senior surgeons but don't have access to people of his skills, that's going to be a huge opportunity for us to disseminate surgical techniques and improvements. That, that makes so much sense to me because mm-hmm. the, there's so much to learn. There's such limited time. Operating room time is so expensive and so difficult to, to get. And, you know, when you're talking about operating on a real patient or even on a cadaver, there's just a limitation in resources. Whereas if you're talking about delivering training virtually, I mean, we talked before about what Justin Barad is doing from Oso VR. Yeah. I think that that solution is a brilliant application on how to get additional experience with how these very complex orthopedic kits come together. I've I've been involved in this space for a number of years now where we've done, you know, all sorts of minimally invasive training, uh, you know, using all sorts of different uh, lab equipment and cameras and things of that sort. But this is leaps and bounds beyond that. And not just simply trying to replicate anatomy and maybe two tools that are inside the abdomen and a camera, but actually taking an entire kit, a spine kit, a hip kit, and actually being able to create all that virtually in a space, which is a, a, an expensive resource to have for training purposes. Yeah, you know what? I absolutely. could agree more. And another interesting thing is that what especially young trainees don't quite realize they're really focused on the operations, for example. And they, what they may not see, may not see well, is everything else that's happening in the operating room that allows that to happen. So that could be the positioning of uh, the, the patient. The, the instruments are actually on the table and not on the table. And if they don't pick up on those other minor things which you can create in a virtual reality environment, you know, you, you, you miss it. So when, you, when you've got a camera that's focused on a surgical field, for example, that is all you're going to show the, 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 the surgeon who's training. When you have the ability to move your eyes anywhere in that, in that space to see what else is going on, um, you actually get a much better sense of what actually is happening. So you're absolutely right. But I think, and I also think it's going to just really up the game, just like video did in the day when, you know, just so many people can crowd around the surgeon and watch what is actually happening, but else is looking at somebody else at the back of their head. Then it comes video, and suddenly you can actually see what people are doing. And now you can have this third generation of augmentation of augmentation of the reality people are experiencing, so they can really get the full picture. So yeah, you're absolutely right. It's going to be very exciting. Are you seeing anything in terms of mixed reality or augmented reality in the actual practice of surgery? I mean, years ago, I know uh, Rafael Grossman did a, a Google Glass surgery. I know other people have done I mean, Shafi, you mentioned earlier, he's done a virtual reality surgery. How about the augmented side of it actually being used inside the operating room at the point of care? Have you seen any sort of applications where that would be useful or, or where that's being tested? I have seen the demos. I'll be perfectly honest, I've not heard of it being widely utilized. There are areas with extremely complicated surgeries where surgeons have been able to pre-operate on a virtual model prior to doing the actual surgery and have claimed that the, that saved them you know, so many hours of time because they know what to expect. Bringing it live into the operating room where you may be seeing a screen of a CT scan or a projection of um, bones deep to the area that you actually operate on to see the fracture patterns, for example, I've definitely seen amazing demos. And I think that when that happens, that could truly be game changing. Because you see, one of the skill sets that we almost can't teach in surgery is three-dimensional viewing. There are people who can look at diagrams or drawings or pl- by planar images and fully understand and project what they see on the screen onto the patient, know where the pieces are deep to the tissues that they're actually looking at. So you know, they can't see the bone, but they know where it is. When you can take that and project that same augmented reality, suddenly you've actually increased the ability of even average surgeons who may not have that inherent skill to understand the complexity of a complex fracture, excuse the iteration of the words there, in a way that they can visualize it very quickly and see where to put a screw or to put a needle and how to avoid a vessel and a nerve. I think that once that becomes a little more um, accessible, I, I can't imagine it will be uh, strongly uptaken. Excellent. And what are some of the other areas of technology that you've seen or that you're excited about getting applied to orthopedics? Well, a couple of things. I think the use of asynchronous tools as opposed to synchronous tools, I think it will make some of the uh, telehealth stuff a lot more interesting. For example, asynchronous video 
so that you're not linked. Because one of the biggest challenges in healthcare is getting a patient and a physician in the same place at the same time. It's only marginally improving. You try to do that virtually over computers. But if you can if you can delink the time, the, the synchronicity of that, it actually makes it a lot easier for both parties and a lot less costly because a few people have to create that moment. And I think uh, asynchronous video is, um, is going to very likely take a big part in, uh, in moving a, a telehealth forward. The other one that I do think is going to become a very big player for us is going to be artificial intelligence. Now, I know it's a very hot topic and everybody talks about it and people are getting a little sick of it, but I think we're, going, we're coming, as a, a few people are saying, we're coming to a point now where basically the, the data – the amount of data available, which is increasing, and the capacity of our uh, software platforms to, to manage the data and give us insight into diagnostics and therapeutics is going to change the way we deliver care pretty significantly. So I do think it's coming. I don't see it there yet, but it's, it's so close. There's so much around the corner. Just uh, yesterday, I was looking at a uh, natural language platform application that uh, is able to essentially read the medical record very cogently. Now, why does that matter? Because maybe a note was written three months ago by another clinician, and in that information, there's information that hadn't been abstracted, which could be an allergy or it could be a surgical procedure, something that changes the way you move forward. Something as simple as that, bringing into an AI platform that can take that information and also not only learn from it, but provide recommendations around treatment with a certain level of certainty and remind surgeons to think about options that may have forgotten to consider. Maybe it's an infection workup. Maybe it's uh, looking for a tumor. I think those things are going to so fundamentally change the way we deliver care that looking back, it's going to feel very uh, rustic. We'll dive back into our discussion in just a moment, but I wanted to take a quick second to tell you about this episode's sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Medible, the app and analytics company for healthcare. You may have heard my interview with Medible CEO, Dr. Michelle Longmire in episode 29. Medible is a fast growing company that was just named by the San Francisco Chronicle as a startup to watch. There's a lot of buzz about this company because Medible combines deep healthcare knowledge with cutting edge Silicon Valley technology. Its solutions are disrupting the $30 billion clinical trial outsourcing market. $30 $30 billion, that's a market ready for disruption. It's no secret that clinical trials continue to grow more complex, and patient recruitment and retention are a major challenge to sponsors. Today's protocols are more demanding than ever, and frequent travel to clinical sites often discourages patients from long-term participation in studies. Did you know that 25% of patients drop out before study completion? In many studies, 50% or more visits can be relocated to a patient's home. For decades, the clinical trials industry has been saddled by legacy technology and workflow inefficiencies. Medible puts patients first and uses mobile tools to bring anywhere, anytime technology to improve recruiting and patient retention. Medible solutions include functionality that replaces e-source, e-consent, and EDC data entry into a study. And they can integrate with EMR, IRT, wearables, and other devices. Solutions that are powered by Medible are HIPAA compliant, auditable, and interoperable right out of the box. The Medible platform serves as the hub for the entire patient record with data spanning all healthcare systems. If you're interested in building clinical apps that patients love and that bridge the gap between the clinic to the app store, check out Medible's Axon. It's easy, it's HIPAA compliant, and it's supported by a robust platform. Give it a try and create your first clinical trial app in just a few minutes. It's true. Go to www.medible.com to schedule a demo. Now let's jump back to the conversation. So as you know, I used to work for Stryker, and there's a huge amount of focus on orthopedics within the Stryker organization, but there are lots of great companies out there. What are some of the companies that you see that are making big investments and big plays in this space? And perhaps there are even ones that are not traditional orthopedic companies that are coming to this digital orthopedic market from outside of that. If so, can you tell us about them? Yeah, it's a very interesting question because a lot of companies are looking at the musculoskeletal space and seeing how they can become more relevant within that space. So I think that the large industry players, everybody from Zimmer Biomet to Johnson & Johnson, the Depew Division of Johnson & Johnson, and Stryker are all looking at how to adopt and implement digital health technologies within their offers to clients to not just maintain relevance, but become players in this new healthcare space that's going to be so data-driven. The 
other companies that may not be obvious are companies like Under Armour. Like, so you got um, at, at Doc SF, we actually have invited Topher Gaylord, who's the general manager for Outdoor at Under Armour, to come in and, and talk about how they're reinventing themselves uh, within their industry and how they're integrating wearable sensors into their clothing. And now they kind of think of themselves now as an, as a, as an incipient data company. They'll provide their client, the client being somebody who purchased their clothing, the kinds of information about their wellness and their activity levels that they haven't been able to provide them in the past in which way, shape, or form. And so they're really looking at that space completely differently. So we've talked about changes in training. We've talked about the way that technology is going to impact the delivery of healthcare. We've talked about uh, artificial intelligence, telehealth, sensors, virtual reality, artificial intelligence. What do you think is going to happen in terms of the changes to the interaction between the patient and the physician? Uh, you wrote a really interesting post on LinkedIn that I'm going to make sure I have a direct link in the show notes of this episode, but a really great article and some insights reflecting on Dr. Topol's book of The Patient Will See You Now. Can you explain to the listeners what you think is going to change and how things are changing in terms of that clinician and patient interaction? It really was an interesting finding. We were, we were working with it as a large healthcare organization, and we, we had found that um, we had a number of patients coming to the clinic who maybe didn't really want surgery, and they were seeing surgeons, and we were like, is there a way for us to answer the questions in a way that precluded the, their visit because it was a prepaid healthcare system? So it was not a fee-for-service. So for us, it was actually a right thing to do to see if we can um, limit these visits. And the assumption was that we could either answer their questions if they were not really interested in surgery, just wanted to hear about it, or maybe we could just get them ready for an appointment. And what happened was that many patients were simply saying, that's great, Dr. Beanie, I'll be more than happy to book my surgery. Uh, and I'm like, okay, well, you haven't actually met me yet. It's, it, it was remarkable to me that they would take such an extraordinarily important step in their lives to book surgery with a surgeon they hadn't met. And then I started realizing that Frankly, I had solved this patient's problem. Their problem was they need to book their operation. They already figured out that they needed one. I've been thinking about it for some time. They had some questions they wanted answered. I could answer those questions because I had the entire electronic record in front of me. I could look at their x-rays going back several years. I knew exactly what, what had happened to them. And so I had essentially solved their problem. And their problem or their solution to the problem did not include come to see me, waiting in my office, driving all the way into town. And so it changed the way I thought about the patient-physician interface. And I said, okay, if the goal for the patient is to solve a problem, then maybe the patient-physician visit, that one-on-one -on -one visit, is not as important as we seem to think. And the other point of reference I think is relevant here is that when we tend to, this, when, when a lot of people are here talking about the future of healthcare, they start premising it on the current state, not only current state, the current patient, and what they might want in the future. And the other point I, I made in that article was that Maybe the current patient will still want to come and see the doctor anyway because it's, there's the patient-physician relationship that they're accustomed to having that they want. But there's a generation behind them and behind mine, actually, a little further behind that, the millennials, who have essentially grown up in a, in a world of technology where their version of relationship does not necessarily include a one-to-one -one, you know, in-person interaction. And for them the value of the proposition included in a one-on-one -on -one person, person interaction may not be nearly as important as it is for our generation, our current generation. And there's so many other things in technology that I didn't get into in that article that are coming, which is the ability of robotics to get into empathetic situations, understand empathy, understand patients maybe better than we're willing to understand them, listening better. There's going to be a number of technologies are going to create experiences that may very well satisfy the, um, the needs of the patient and solve their problem in ways that truly will not need the in-person interaction. So what Dr. Topol's title was, the patient will see you now, pointing out that we're moving to a more patient-centric environment where patients will have a greater say in how their healthcare is delivered. And I was arguing, well, the patient may never want to see you at all, if at all possible, if they, have, if they can have their problems solved in ways that don't include spending an hour in my office. 
Now, there's always going to be an element of empathy and human interaction that will be valuable. I'm not saying that's going to go away entirely. I'm just going to, I'm just arguing that the entire concept of the physician-patient interaction is going to fundamentally change, not just because the technology enables it, but because the generational change in the attitude towards that kind of relationship is going to fundamentally change. Those two things put together suggest to me that the patient visit may be a thing of the distant past. So the title of the article is The Patient Won't See Me Now or at All If They Can Help It. Uh, I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to make sure I include a link to that in the show notes. It's a great article. I want everybody to go check that out. And I think it's really interesting. And this is actually part of the reason I like the term digital health because I'm fully aware that eventually the word digital is going to drop away from that and it's just going to become health. And it's just like 20 years ago we were talking about digital banking and now it's just banking. You deposit checks through your phone. You take money out without ever having to, to see a person. You do it at the grocery store when you're paying for something. You go back a little bit further and you look at the way that the travel industry has changed where people would say, wait, you know, instead of dealing with a travel agent, you now go online and book your own tickets and, and find out your own options. And then you don't even get tickets in the mail. I mean, a lot of this is foreign to a lot of listeners, I'm sure. They don't even remember a time where you had to wait for your tickets to arrive in the mail so you could go to the airport and take your flight. Now they're checking in with their Apple Watches uh, at the gate. So, And that certainly is going to happen in, in healthcare. I think it's going to happen faster and faster. And I'm really pleased that you're leading the charge on this vertical around orthopedics. And you're not only just talking about it, you're actually doing some things about it. What, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing at uh, UCSF and the program that you've started that's coming up in January? Oh, yes. Thank you very much. The Digital Orthopedic Conference. Digital Orthopedic Conference is um, an attempt to try to catalyze the adoption of digital health tools within the vertical of orthopedics for the reasons we talked about at the beginning of the, uh, of the conversation. And so our goal is to bring together the leaders in healthcare from the entire ecosystem that actually can drive change forward. So it's not meant to be an all-encompassing conference. There's only about 200, 250 people who attend this event. And we tackle a couple of concepts and we go quite deep so this year is ai and also virtual reality and try to get in there and understand how these tools are adopt, ad adapted so we have a competition that we invite any of your listeners to please apply for where we take startups or even established companies that have a product or an idea that they implemented bring it to us show us what you did show us why you did it so for the outcome Tell us how much it costs. Tell us what you learned from the implementation. And then there'll be a panel of experts that range from scientists to businessmen and coders who will ask the tough questions around, okay, well, how did that actually happen? So that the rest of the audience can really understand how to implement the technology when they go home and what the, some of these top companies are. And we imbue that whole event with um, some social sciences because it's important to understand, as has been made the point made often, that technology by itself won't solve the problem. You still have to implement change across your healthcare system or your organization. And to do that, we are going to have whole sessions on leadership, design thinking, and understand the policies and politics that, that surround healthcare. So you get a holistic approach to changing and how to drive these technologies within uh, these verticals that are very, very successfully adopting them. So I'm on your website now. So it's docsf, D-O-C-S-F dot org. And I'm looking at the 2018 roster and your agenda. See, so you've put together a great cadre of, of speakers here. You've got uh, Stuart Simpson, a gentleman I used to work with when he was based over here in Europe. And leading up to the striker side, you've got people from J&J. &J. Uh, I've got uh, Jamie Edwards, who actually I'm scheduled to speak with shortly about what he's doing at, at Cloudbreak. And Nick Adkins, who was a guest on the podcast a few weeks ago. Really great list of speakers. Daniel Kraft as well, I see he's on here. So I uh, certainly encourage people to check out the website. And if they can make it to sign up, it's happening just before the J.P. Morgan conference. Isn't that right? Yeah, that way people who are going to J.P. Morgan can uh, do both relatively quickly. So it's a Sunday before J.P. Morgan, correct, in San Francisco. And actually, you've timed it really well. So it's January 7th. And then on the 8th and 9th of January is the Startup Health Festival. That's right. And then the J.P. Morgan Conference starts. I can't remember if it's the 9th or the 10th of January. but um, So it, that, that'll be a great week there in San Francisco for a lot of health innovation. Well, listen, I, I want to encourage everyone who's listening to take a look at the website for DocSF. And I think you've got an exciting program there. Really pleased to see the focus around digital health and the orthopedics vertical. And really pleased to see that you're getting so much support behind it. And you've put together a great uh, list of speakers. And I'm sure it's going to be a fantastic event. This is only the second year that it's run, right? So you're just getting started. Yes, correct. And hopefully we'll bring it to Europe and have partnerships over there with some of the uh, 
institutions in that area and maybe uh, create a platform that others can build on and create doc SFs uh, all over the planet. That's brilliant. Yeah, well, whatever I can do to help that, please do let me know. I've got, I've got six questions that I like to ask every guest. Dr. Beanie, do you have a few more minutes for me? Absolutely. Thanks, Dan. Terrific. So the first question is, uh, what's a saying, quote, or phrase that motivates you? You know, I tell you, I, I'll give you the one I heard most recently, and I actually love it. And it's uh, spend spend more time being interested and less time being interesting. What advice do you have for others working to innovate in healthcare? I think almost everybody that's come on your show has sort of said some iteration of the same thing, which is to be persistent. And I I I strongly believe that. I agree with that that perception. The idea being that if you have something you really want to accomplish, just go ahead and do it. it doesn't matter if somebody else is doing it or doing it better. I think that the important thing is that you find something you're passionate about, you believe in, and just do your best at doing it. I change course frequently, and I think that that's great advice too. Is don't stick to your guns longer than than is appropriate, and sometimes it's hard to do that. But whether it's uh, starting a brand new conference and realizing you haven't quite hit your mark, or starting a conference and realizing you did really hit your mark, and just stay with it, it's 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 all a matter of um, being uh, being persistent, but also being realistic and understanding what your customers are asking of you. What's a book that you recommend to our listeners? Um, I'm really enjoying Thomas Friedman's uh, Thank You for Being Late. It's not the latest book on the shelf, but it's a really, really great book and an optimist guide for thinking in the age of uh, acceleration. I, I really enjoy the historical background he provides to current care platforms or whatever. And the beauty of it is that understanding where things came from in such a succinct and well-written way really helps me understand where it's going to go next. What's a piece of tech that you wouldn't want to live without? It can be software, an app, a device. Uh, I, I was going to say the electronic medical record. It's something that everybody loves to hate, but if you can ask anybody who has one whether they could, they would gladly go back to paper, the answer is always no, or most people would say no. So I think uh, some of these things that are could be better but still very helpful. I also couldn't live without Strava, <laughs> which is a great cycling app. <laughs> All right. I'm not familiar with that one, but I'll make sure I include the link on that one. If I give you a check for $5 million for you to invest in health technology today, how would you invest it? I think I'd invest in AI. I know it's a little trite, but there's uh, some really interesting companies working on delinking the physician from the computer keyboard as a way to improve their ability to interface with the patient, which does not necessarily have to be an in-person visit, but still take away the documentation side. And I think those technologies are going to really enable us to, to do more for more patients in a shorter time frame for less money. So kind of hit all three triple aims. So I, I would invest in AI looking at the uh, optimization of the uh, physician interface with the um, EMR. Any particular companies that spring to mind? The one I'm thinking about most is Cloud Medics. I think they've been called out as one of the uh, small leaders in this field that are really up there with the big boys, whether it's Apple or Google, uh, work in the space. They're doing really amazing work. Great. I'm, I'll look them up. I'll put a link to it on the show notes. And last thing is, we make a contribution to a charity in appreciation of your time on this show. What charity have you selected? And can you tell me a little bit about what they do? You know, I, I've been thinking about uh, I, I think, frankly, the Red Cross at this point and the, work, and the problem that we're having in Florida and Houston and supporting the the folks that are struggling with uh, what I cannot I can't even fathom the idea of losing literally everything um, you've ever built up. Um, I think those people right now need uh, and this happens to have struck home in the United States early. I know it happens frequently elsewhere in the world, but for the time being, I think the United States Red Cross would would be a great place to go. Excellent. I'll make sure I include a link to that on the show notes, and we'll make a donation in your name to them. Thanks for nominating their work. It is a terrible thing that's happening down there in the southern parts of the states, and uh, happy to. Uh, put some uh, money towards that cause to help people get back on their feet. Uh, so, Dr. Beanie, thanks very much for taking time on the show. It, I know that people can go to docsf.org to find out more about the conference. How can people follow you? Uh, well, I, I, I have really enjoyed the LinkedIn platform. I think uh, I'm at uh, Stephen Obini on LinkedIn, and uh, that's where I post many of my thoughts, and I, I think that's probably the best place. Also on Twitter. Yeah, I mentioned one article on there, but you have several great articles that are on your po on your LinkedIn profile. So I'll include a link to your profile and to your Twitter feed, uh, as well as the, the docsf.org website. So is there anything else that you'd like to say to the audience before I let you go? Subscribe to this podcast. I, it's, it's one of the few that I actually listen to every time it comes up. I really enjoyed the learning from uh, from the, your, your, your guests. And also, I love the way you ask the questions and drill down to some of these ideas. So that's, that's my advice. Stick, stick, with, uh, stick with this podcast and listen. 
There you have it, Professor Stefano Bini, orthopedic surgeon at UCSF and chair of the Digital Orthopedic Conference. We recorded this episode before Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, so Professor Beanie didn't mention it specifically when he nominated the Red Cross for his donation. We did go ahead and make a donation directly to the Hurricane Maria Relief Fund at the Red Cross, so hopefully that money is on its way to support some of the relief efforts there. Grab the show notes for all the links we discussed by visiting digitalhealthtoday.com forward slash 43. You'll definitely want to check out some of the articles Professor Beanie has published, and you can find the links on the website. We have more great guests coming up next week. Tune in to hear Jamie Edwards of Cloudbreak Health. We're going to talk about humanizing healthcare. We talk about physician burnout, understanding patients, and of course, technology. We also have a great podcast coming up with Oz Gadir, where we dive into the microbiome, food allergies, and all sorts of cool, well, we'll just call it stuff. And earlier in this episode, you heard us mention Justin Barad of Also VR. It's O S S O V R, Also VR. That guy is burning it up out there with his VR training system. We have an interview coming up with him. We've already done it. Just waiting to release it. We're going to dive into the use of tech to train surgeons, accelerate learning, and prepare clinicians using the power of virtual reality. You won't want to miss it. That's just the tip of the iceberg, folks. We have so much more in store. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast in iTunes or in your favorite podcast player. And be sure to join us in the digital health community. Go to the website digitalhealthtoday.com and use any of the links to sign up and join the thousands of innovators around the world who are tuning in and pushing the boundaries of health and health care. Hey, and don't forget to check out medible.com. Many thanks to them for supporting the show. Jump on their website, sign up for a demo of Axon. You'll be surprised at how fast you can create your first clinical trial app. You're going to be surprised. That's all I can say. Try it out. Let me know what you think. And do me a favor. Tell them that you heard about it here. We appreciate their support and making these episodes possible. Keep your comments, questions, and suggestions coming. Ping me on Twitter at HealthTechDan or follow the show at DHealthToday. You can also email me directly at dan at digitalhealthtoday.com. I love hearing from you and learning how we can use this platform to help you grow and succeed. All right, that's all for me for now. Thanks for tuning in to episode 43. Until next time, keep on innovating.